So I'll welcome all of you to our webinar uh, on securing citizenship. This, this webinar marks the release of our report, uh, which we had written over the last many months at the Center for Public Interest Law, which is at Jindal Global Law School. And the report gives a detailed account of uh, India's legal obligations vis-a-vis -vis citizenship and statelessness in India. Um, the report is public, and uh, if you haven't seen it already, we do encourage you to take a look at it. We can put the link of the report uh, on, on uh, Zoom right now. Uh, this has been a labor of love, despite how challenging uh, the subject matter may have been or how challenge the, uh, challenging the context in which the report uh, has been written. It was written during the COVID crisis, uh, and it was meant to be a collaborative effort among uh, students from two completely different continents. Uh, and this, of course, uh, was also challenging because of the nature of the intervention. This is a very sensitive issue, as, as you know. With us today, we, of course, have three absolutely wonderful and qualified guests uh, who will illuminate this topic uh, from a range of different perspectives. Uh, you know them already, but I'll quickly introduce them uh, in the order of uh, them speaking. Uh, we'll start with uh, Sujata Ramchandran. She's a research associate at Belsili uh, School of International Affairs at Waterloo, and she's written extensively on the legal issues related to citizenship in India. Uh, Mr. Oliola Laskar is a renowned lawyer from Assam who has been a prominent voice on citizenship issues for a long time. Uh, he has represented numerous excluded persons uh, it, in the Guwahati High Court. He's also been a very prominent voice uh, representing uh, many of these issues in the public domain. He's an expert on the legal issues of citizenship determination in India. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Amalda Chekera. Uh, he's a human rights lawyer, he's a co-founder and co-director of the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion, and also co-founder of the European Network on Statelessness. Uh, I should also say he has been a friend and a guide uh, for all of us who have uh, written this report. Now, before I move on to the panel, uh, I just wanted to give a quick sense of what the report is really about. Uh, the report is a product of a collaboration between uh, our center at Jindal, and the Faculty of Law at Lille Catholic University in France. The students of these two universities were the primary researchers and authors who, as I said, wrote this report starting in January, February, and then uh, wrapped up the report in September. Uh, I must thank Dr. Valentina Volpe from Lille for making this collaboration happen. Uh, on behalf of the authors, I would also like to thank our esteemed, esteemed advisors, Yanis uh, Panosis, uh, Nirja Gopaljal, Pravihi Madri, and Amal Chekera, who's here, um, and also Professor B.S. Chimney, who was kind enough to write the foreword uh, to this report. Uh, we were also very, kind, uh, we were very grateful to receive endorsements from uh, prominent scholars in the field, uh, Professor Chume, uh, Joshua Castellano, uh, Michelle Foster, uh, Bronwyn Manby, uh, were very kind to go through the report and, uh, and give and offer their endorsements, which we have put at the beginning of the report. Um, and of course, our institutional collaborators, Paricha, who's also uh, the co-organizer of this webinar, uh, the Peter McMillan Center uh, in Melbourne, and the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion. Now, this report, in a, as a substantive matter, seeks to intervene in what we see to be a crisis of citizenship in contemporary India. Uh, when the so-called final list of Assam's NRC came out last year, more than 1.9 million Indian residents were pushed to uh, the verge of statelessness. Their future remains uncertain, if not bleak. Uh, the Indian state has not told us what their policy regarding them is, uh, what will happen to them if they also fail to prove their citizenship and nationality in the foreigners tribunals to which they are now meant to appeal. It's been more than one year, and we still do not know when the tribunals will start hearing these matters, or even whether the NRC in its current form will survive. The future of these excluded persons remains worrisome and our report calls them precarious citizens. They're precarious because they're citizens, but their citizenship status is compellingly insecure. A lack of consistent and humane policy is also absent in other areas. India has not signed up on the refugee convention. We do not have a rights oriented policy for the stateless. And ironically, this is despite the fact that the refugee crisis of partition is foundational for our country. And of course, numerous 
uh, stateless and refugee populations, whether the Tibetans, Sri Lankans, Bengalis, and most recently the Rohingyas have migrated into India. Our report seeks to introduce a stronger sense of India's domestic and international legal obligations in this conversation. Sadly, these norms are missing in our political debates, and they are unfortunately equally missing in how our courts are deciding some of these matters. Our panelists will throw more light on what the weaknesses of the policies on citizenship are. Uh, they will give a more detailed context of the issues on the ground and how we should appreciate these developments in the larger global context. But before I move on to my panelists, I would request my colleague Ashish Shadar, who also supervised the writing of this report, uh, to take a few minutes to summarize the key arguments of this report. Thank you very much, Mohsen, and thank you everyone for joining again. Uh, securing Citizenship Report is divided into three chapters, citizenship status, detention, and socioeconomic rights. Each chapter addresses India's international law obligations vis-a-vis -vis both categories of persons we address, precarious uh, citizens in Assam and stateless persons in Indian territory. The status chapter lays out two intertwined standards in international law, the right to nationality for every individual, and the duty of states to prevent and reduce statelessness. Very famously, during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Indian representative Hansa Mehta called Article 15 the fundamental right. The report analyzes this right to nationality, Article 15 UDHR, with reference to the genuine link test from the Nottebom decision of the International Court of Justice. It argues that precarious citizens in Assam have a genuine link to India through their long-term habitual residence, extensive family ties, participation in public life, and their attachment to India, all of the elements which Nottebaum had specified. The absence of their genuine link with any other country, namely Bangladesh, which is the alleged country of nationality, strengthens the genuine link to India. Stateless persons in India who also have a genuine link in, in cases uh, uh, where these elements are present. The report also examines the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee on the right to nationality. The committee has interpreted the phrase his own country from Article 12, Clause 4 of the ICCPR and said that there exist factors other than nationality which may establish close and enduring connections between a person and a country, connections which may be stronger than those of nationality. The report argues that despite India's reservation to the article, precarious citizens in Assam enjoy all the Article 12 rights. The report then examines cases where Indian courts have appreciated this right to nationality. After this, the report delves into right against arbitrary deprivation of nationality. This section addresses the procedural aspects of the right, such as due process requirements and procedural standards in international law on nationality. It also, it also elaborates on substantive elements, which are racial and ethnic discrimination and the duty to avoid statelessness. The arguments around procedural aspects include various due process, due process concerns about foreigner tribunals in Assam, and they also include the standards of legitimate purpose and proportionality. Then in the second subsection, subsection of the chapter, uh, we talk about state's duty to prevent and reduce statelessness. This obligation is a part of emerging customer international law and applies to India, despite it not being party to the two conventions. The report also refers to the jurisprudence of African Court of Human Rights and European Court of Human Rights on the issue. More importantly, the report also discusses various Indian cases where the courts have liberally interpreted domestic statutes and recognized India's international law obligations. The latter part of the status chapter pertains to stateless persons in Indian territory whose citizenship was not deprived as a result of any action of the Indian state. They came to India to seek asylum. They have no avenues of return to their country of nationality as a result of their statelessness. The various terms in Indian legislation, such as illegal migrant, foreigner, citizen, all operate on an assumption that the person whose status is to be ascertained is in possession of at least one nationality, even if that nationality is not Indian. None of these terms can be used interchangeably for a stateless person. That the legislations in India do not define or acknowledge the phenomenon of statelessness. These international obligations, as I've specified, command the states to naturalize all stateless persons in, in its territory. India must recognize stateless persons formally and issue identity certificates to them. Passport rules of 1980 grant the Ministry of External Affairs the power to grant uh, these certificates of identity. However, the duty of the state under international law, constitutional law, and human rights law does not end with issuing such certificates. 
India must grant them nationality. Indian courts have some promising jurisprudence on this issue, and they've echoed uh, the arguments that we've included in the report. This chapter also includes recommendations to harmonize India's citizenship laws with international law on statelessness. The second chapter, detention, addresses the protection of civil and political liberties of precarious citizens in Assam and stateless persons in India. The rampant reliance on detention for deportation in India poses a grave threat to the life and liberty of individuals. This chapter extends a four-pronged argument. Firstly, the chapter argues that arbitrary detention of precarious citizens and stateless persons is prohibited since the deportation does not serve as a legitimate purpose for them and it is disproportionate. Despite this prohibition, there is evidence to show that precarious citizens in Assam and stateless persons in India are detained for very long intervals. This section further argues that prohibition of indefinite detention uh, should be included because it is inherently arbitrary. The chapter then specifies many human rights compliant alternatives to detention, which must be available in situations where determination of nationality of persons uh, is undertaken by the state. These principles must be cautiously resorted to, and this should never become alternative forms of detention. They're endorsed by international law, national best practices, by the jurisprudence of the Indian Supreme Court, and are in line with the principle of minimum intervention. Thirdly, detention for deportation practices cannot ignore procedural and substantive rights, which are generally available to all incarcerated persons. These rights involve the right to legal aid, the right to review, the right to information and notice, and the right to release. Lastly, the chapter addresses the situation of children who are a vulnerable group among existing detainees and argues that India must protect uh, these children from incarceration, that India should, should, not, should not detain children for deportation. Uh, and it also evokes India's statutory framework in place, which promotes the best interests of the child. The last chapter, Socioeconomic Rights, focuses on the undeniable effect of precarious citizenship and statelessness on these rights. Given the precarious position of individuals who've been left off the NRC in Assam and that of stateless persons in India, both domestic and international legal frameworks provide stipulations for how these communities should be protected. India must ensure that minimum core obligations are met despite the reality of citizens themselves facing numerous obstacles in accessing these rights. Indian courts have historically affirmed the same despite arguments of the state's financial restraints. Despite India's lack of a comprehensive refugee and statelessness policy, the national policy, uh, national practice with analogous communities like the Tibetans and UNHCR registered refugees sheds light on the range of basic socioeconomic rights that the state can and must extend to all vulnerable communities irrespective of their citizenship status. These rights include access to documentation, healthcare, food and nutrition, shelter, uh, housing and sanitation, education and employment, and a particular obligation to protect children as per robust international and Indian law. In conclusion, the report argues that India is legally bound to prevent and reduce statelessness. This obligation mandates that India must affirm the citizenship of precarious citizens being subjected to arbitrary citizenship deprivation procedures, particularly in Assam. India must grant nationality to stateless persons in its territory in accordance with international law. It also argues that India cannot detain state precarious citizens and stateless persons, and it must ensure the full gamut of socioeconomic rights available to stateless persons in Indian territory. Thank you. I hope this, uh, I hope you'll find this report useful in many areas of research and advocacy, and I look forward to the panelists' comment. Uh, comments. Thank you. Over to you, Mohsen. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, that was a tough job trying to summarize uh, a, quite a long report. Uh, and I could see you uh, rush through many important areas. So I, uh, I hope uh, all of you are able to look at the report whenever you have time. Uh, all right. So now we'll move on to the panel. Um, I would request uh, Dr. Ramchandran to start uh, the proceedings. Uh, and after that, uh, Mr. Laskar and then uh, uh, Mr. Dichekera. Uh, 
Can you see my PowerPoint presentation now? Yes? Yes. Uh, okay, okay, great. So first of all, let me begin by thanking Mohsin and Ashish for inviting me to be one of the distinguished speakers uh, at this webinar. Um, I'm very honored to have been asked to be one of the speakers at this webinar. I also wanted to congratulate them and especially all of the student authors for this remarkable document that they have produced, which makes a very strong case for harmonizing India's policies and practices towards vulnerable categories of migrants and residents with its international commitments and obligations. Now, I must say that I am not an expert on citizenship. My work doesn't focus on citizenship, neither am I a legal expert. I don't have any background or training in law. Although interestingly enough, my work often tends to focus on those aspects again and again. And I really wish I had access to this report some time back. I would have used it for some of my own research. And I certainly will be using it for my future research. Now, I've been given a rather difficult and challenging task, which is of providing the political and historical dimensions to the crisis of citizenship. And as you can imagine, it is a very tough thing to do in about 10 minutes. Uh, people have written books on it and some aspects haven't been uh, focused on adequately, um, but I'm going to try my best. And as you can imagine that that particular backdrop, those circumstances have had an enormous bearing on what is happening today. It's tied to what's happening in Assam. Um, and that's a very, so it's very important to to examine those, those political and historical dimensions. So for some reason, I'm not able. Okay. Okay. So there is a very long history to this crisis of citizenship and that history can be actually, in the case of Assam at least, uh, traced even further back beyond the formation of independent post-colonial nation states in the Indian subcontinent can go back to the colonial history, the organization of the colonial economy, um, the setting up of plantations. So there are many, many complexities that go into it. But I'm going to start with the moment at which decolonization happened and independent post-colonial nation states were formed uh, in 1947 of India uh, and what was then West and East Pakistan and subsequently Bangladesh in 1971. And as we know that that partition, that separation, the, the demarcation of territory happened on the basis of the dominant uh, religious identity. And by doing that, of course, it has entrenched this notion that belonging and inclusion in the nation state in the Indian subcontinent is tied to the majoritarian, the dominant political, the dominant religious identity. And that is, of course, playing out in all of the three countries in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And certainly when you see that there is a growth in religious fundamentalist ideas. Um, the other thing was that because the partition happened on the basis of that religious identity and it led to large scale sectarian violence, it inevitably led to ref large scale refugee flows. So people moved in large numbers across borders and then the newly found state authorities had to or newly uh, appointed new state authorities had to deal with these large scale refugee flows. As a result of these migrations, what were really um, forced migrations, um, it entrenched also localized anxieties which were tied to ethnic and cultural differences. So in Assam, for instance, um, there, the, the understanding of who the legitimate insider is very much tied to a localized identity. They did not want others to come from other territories who were somewhat different from them. And of course, that is a, 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 a kind of a difficult notion um, in, in many ways. It also eventually led to the emergence of certain public discourses around infiltration and infiltrators. And essentially it is suggesting, which emerged in I think the 1960s, and it uh, conveyed the idea that there were people who are entering India and becoming part of India but who really did not belong and who were pretending to belong. And that, that 
uh, that image of the infiltration and infiltrators was again resurrected in the 1990s. Um, and as you can see in this, um, the public hoarding, the, the image that I'm showing on this, uh, this particular slide, um, the acceptance of migrants and refugees in India is becoming increasingly tied to religious identity. So in some ways, the opposition to the Rohingya refugees is also rooted in the fact that they practice a certain religion. It is not because they're migrants and they're coming from outside. So um, the other thing that I should point out is that the disproportionate focus in India has been really on one particular group, the so-called irregular Bangladeshi migrants. And of course, that itself is a highly vexed category. So as I mentioned that uh, there is a very strong discourse on what is called infiltration and infiltrators, um, centering on the figure of what is known as the irregular Bangladeshi migrant, the illegal Bangladeshi migrant. And it has two other components. A, this idea that uh, Bangladeshis have been coming into India freely, there have been no restrictions, there have been um, no attempts to deter them. And of course, uh, this the statement, anonymous statement kind of conveys the idea. The second point is that India has been excessively soft and tolerant in its approach to migrants. And because there were very little attempts at deterring these migrants, that has also been perceived as a, a strong, uh, uh, a limitation in this particular uh, in in this particular setting, and of course the political cartoon here is conveying this idea that uh, the border was open and people were able to come in very easily, uh, without any restrictions, and no attempt was made to deter them. Um, So as I said previously, the, in India, the, the crisis of irregular migration, also in some ways, the crisis of citizenship is really tied to largely one particular group, the, the so-called Bangladeshis. And in this case, religious identities have become very important. And it's largely because uh, the migrants, the undesirable migrants in this case, look very much like the Indians. And it has, and assimilation of some of those for a certain period of time has also made it much harder to identify them. And when you cannot identify them, you have very crude stereotypes about who can be the regular migrant. And in this case, anybody who is speaks Bengali, who's Muslim, and so those sort of ideas have become very popular. Um, from the 1990s, there has been a growth of anti-Muslim xenophobia in India, and that has, of course, given an enormous credence and strength to these, the crisis of irregular migration. And as we know that because it is tied very much to religious identity, um, in recent years, there have been attempts to kind of separate out who the irregular migrant is on the basis of religion. So we know that under the Foreigners Act, certain exemptions have been made for certain migrant groups from neighboring countries who will not be penalized even if they have lived in India, they don't have, or their passports and visas have expired. And increasingly there has been attempt to emphasize the deterrent and punitive approach to manage these migrations. So, there, was, there has been a tremendous expansion of the border fence. Uh, there, are, there has been a great emphasis on using very punitive kind of uh, mechanisms such as migrant detention and deportation. And also that in the crude stereotype of who is an irregular migrant, it is often assumed that these are poor people who perform certain jobs. So for example, in Delhi, where my research is based, it was assumed that people living in slum clusters were largely Bangladeshi migrants. Uh, anybody who's a rag picker were Bangladeshi migrants. That was not always the case, but those kind of crude ideas have been very popular. Um, and they have often not been checked. Now, just to show you some data on it. Now, this is not, um, there are lots of challenges with data, but uh, 
at least, and this is not very new, but it gives you a sense of the pattern. And what you're seeing, of course, is that Bangladeshis dominate migrant detention and de deportation practices, and they dominate it to the extent that uh, they were really the focus, the disproportionate focus of such mechanisms of migrant detention, deportation, centered largely on one neighboring country that was Bangladesh. So uh, their share in total deportations has been uh, well over 86, 85, 86%. And we also see the same thing in when we look at the numbers of pre-trial detainees and convicted non-citizens. Sometimes this may legitimize certain stereotypes about the Bangladeshis that they are criminals. But actually, if you look carefully at the number, then you realize that many of these people are actually have been detained only because they are perceived to have um, flouted or not conformed to India's immigration laws. Um, and we also know that it may not be very certain if all of those who were categorized as Bangladeshi migrants are actually indeed Bangladeshi migrants. So that is another challenge here. So I'm going to end here the, in the last slide. I'm going to take certain points out of the report, which connects to my own research, um, which I thought were really important. And I think a couple of these were already talked about briefly by Mohsin and Ashish. Uh, and the first challenge is the provisions of the Foreigners Act, which is, uh, um, which is an act which was formalized in 1946 at a period of uh, transition to a post-colony, but in its substantive content and spirit is really a colonial era act. It is really not rooted in liberal jurisprudence. It has very little understanding of uh, human rights, uh, very weak procedural protections. And it also gives the state enormous powers, I think. Uh, and it is, of course, being used very regularly. And some of the key challenges here are is that it, and as the report points out very rightly so, that it does not dis distinguish between different categories of non-citizen groups. It only separates out the citizen versus the foreigner. Actually, it doesn't even talk about the illegal migrant. There is no category there, ironically. That category actually was added to the Citizenship Act when the amendment took place in the early 2000s, when the provision for creating the National Register of Citizens was created. And as you can see, that did not happen because clearly there was some understanding that it would be a very difficult exercise for India. It is very complicated. Uh, it is very expensive as well for the state. It is also a burden for the state. Uh, the, and as Mohsin pointed out earlier, that the fact that India has not signed any of the conventions, established conventions on refugees, it doesn't have a national law on refugees, then the process of giving protection to refugees become uh, very arbitrary and it is often not, it, does, it is not grounded in what are very established norms for refugee protection. We know that state, the relevant state authorities do have some discretion, but as you can see that it can become very selective. Some groups can be accepted and others cannot. And there's also lack of clarity on what rights, what rights and entitlements do refugees and asylum seekers have in India. So it's a very critical question. The other important point is that the onus of proving citizenship lies with the individual who has been accused of not being a citizen or rather in this case the regular migrant and we know that that is a very very difficult challenge because people don't have adequate set of documents and in the absence of documents they can be treated as irregular migrants um, we also know that the fact that some of the migrants who arrived earlier were given certain set of documents brings enormous suspicion to the documents that people present and um, police have also been known to destroy documents sometimes. The third point is that very there are very weak due process protections, especially in regard to detention. There is no limit on the length of detention, and that actually violates uh, certain provisions of the Constitution. We know that if anybody is arrested, there are certain protections there, but here it is not applied, and that's very problematic. Um, I've already talked about the documentary evidence to prove citizenship and in India where um, 
the birth registration and the set of official documents that people hold is very much tied to class status that becomes a very challenge and of course it becomes a challenge because we know that the crude stereotype of who can be an irregular bangladeshi migrants means that they are focusing disproportionately on poor people who don't then have documents to prove they are and we are hearing very disturbing reports from assam where people who have been branded as irregular bangladeshi migrants then having to sell off all their meager assets to then fund legal challenges so what is very clear is that a mere accusation can have a very uh, detrimental long term effect on the life of an individual lives of families um the other question is how are undesirable migrants identified and this is also uh, um, a very important question to ask now in the 1990s there was a slum cluster in delhi called the motia khan basti which uh, received uh, all of the residents of that slum received uh, uh, notifications asking them to provide evidence uh, to prove that they were indian citizens and in this particular case uh, it was not indicated they went to court they they fought the case um it was never clearly indicated what the basis of what the information that they had that had made their presence um uh, suspicious uh, or their uh, their nationality had been disputed and it was clear that perhaps very crude understanding of who could be this was a slum that had very large number of muslim residents and they were they definitely had no association with with uh, bangladesh uh, at all and had it not been for a presence of a uh, a very active ngo there they probably would have lost their status as well so it was really intervention by civil society organization that prevented them from losing their citizenship status the final point i want to make is that while um we are also seeing a very disturbing pattern of a contradictory role of the judiciary where on the one hand as the report shows that um uh, judges and courts have sometimes uh, upheld uh, you know the rule of law they recognize uh, human rights they often refer to international um, commitments and uh, and i was fascinated by the prableen kaur case for example um but on the other hand we also know that the judiciary has played an equally important role in intensifying the deterrence approach we know that uh so what how, how does one manage those contradictory tendencies so i'm going to end my uh, presentation at this point um thank you very much thank you so much uh, sujata uh, we'll now move on to uh, mr oliola uh, and i know that some of you are asking questions feel free to keep writing questions uh, and of course we'll only take them up after all the three panelists have uh, Uh, share their remarks with us um over to you uh, mr asker uh, thank you very much thank you uh, professor mohsin bhat and also ashes yadav for uh, giving me this uh, honor to take part in this uh, deliberation and uh, the uh, also thank you uh, all the uh, contributors and authors of the report uh, securing citizenship this is an um, meticulously prepared report well or good report and um, i think uh, this uh, report will be uh, will also be helpful for people like us who are practicing in courts in india uh, importantly because uh, it uh, compares the indian uh, domestic jurisprudence uh, with the international uh, jurisprudence on the uh, citizenship uh, rights and uh, Uh, statelessness and all those things so uh, um, as a practicing lawyer in assam uh, i'll share my understanding and experiences brief very briefly um so uh, let me start with the with the processes that are going on in assam as of now uh, there are uh, five processes are there Uh, they uh, which uh, uh, result in uh, making people uh, stateless or uh, uh, putting the people on the verge of uh, becoming stateless this uh, the the first process is under the um, immigrants expulsion from assam act 1950 uh, that uh, gives uh, 
uh, unfettered power to the executive to, to uh, expel anyone from uh, Assam if they think that this person is an illegal uh, migrant. So uh, there is no uh, procedure for judicial determination. Uh, there is a, an exception. Uh, this uh, act provides that uh, people who came from the specified territories, that is the, the, the present day Bangladesh mainly, so uh, due to civil disturbance um, cannot be expelled. But uh, this uh, act is now not being uh, used as such. Uh, uh, the Assam government's white paper published in 2012 uh, says that uh, the use of uh, the provisions of this act was stopped uh, after um, international pressure uh, uh, put to bear in uh, the 60s, in the first part of the 60s. So this, uh, but still this act is in force. Then uh, in the 60s, uh, when uh, this uh, use of this uh, act was stopped, the, the government of India promulgated order under the Foreigners Act, the Foreigners Tribunal Order 1964. And uh, this uh, order provided, as uh, we have uh, seen in the report, that uh, uh, for establishment of uh, foreigners tribunals, which are known as FTs, uh, to determine the citizenship. This is uh, apart from the process uh, 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 under the criminal law. The, 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 these are uh, this, uh, the three processes I'm talking about. The one is the uh, under the Immigrants Expulsion from Asham Act 1950, and the other is the uh, under FT process, and uh, the other uh, a criminal process uh, is also the, the, the section 14 of the Foreigners Act and uh, the Passport Entry into India Act. Uh, but uh, a, a, anybody who is uh, suspected as a foreigner or as an illegal immigrant or uh, a person, a, an immigrant who uh, has overstayed his uh, 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 travel, overstayed his uh, travel documents, stayed after expiry of the travel document or entered India without any valid travel document are uh, arrested and prosecuted in the uh, court of uh, judicial magistrate under the uh, section four of the foreigners act and uh, the uh, passport entry into india the result in conviction and sentence um, uh, 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 under the passport entry into india act i think it is three years and uh, maximum sentence and uh, seven years under the foreigners act so this is a criminal uh, process but uh, the uh, order of 1964 under the Foreigners Tribunal Act, titled as the uh, uh, Foreigners Tribunal Order, establishes a Foreigners Tribunal, uh, which is uh, an, uh, an administrative tribunal in a sense. And uh, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a proceeding, in the nature of civil proceeding determines the citizenship of persons who are uh, referred to them for their opinion as to whether the person uh, was not a foreigner. So this uh, process started mainly after uh, the, uh, in the 60s, late 60s. So, um, and at the same time, for uh, making reference to the foreigners tribunal, the Assam government established a, a, a police branch within the Assam police uh, known as border police. Uh, their job was to uh, investigate uh, the suspect cases of uh, 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 foreigners, illegal immigrants, and then refer them to the tribunals for, their, uh, for the tribunal's opinion as to the status of the person relating to their citizenship. So this uh, um, I'm, uh, uh, and in the last year, a case made headlines. Of, uh, the case uh, was related to a person named Sanaullah, who was in the Indian Army and who fought the war in uh, with Pakistan in Kargil, uh, who is a Kargil hero, as uh, media say. This person was declared foreigner 
by a tribunal ex parte. Uh, no, he contested case and the, 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 his all documents, he could not prove his citizenship in the tribunal. This is an illustrative case. He was arrested, detained, and then uh, the High Court uh, uh, granted him bail while the challenge to the foreigner's tribunal opinion was uh, is pending, still pending before the High Court. So the, this case also uh, brought out how the border police function and make uh, references to the tribunal. Uh, the Sanaullah uh, later on, um, when he was released, he filed cases against the police and uh, uh, other two people, accusing them of forging signatures of uh, two people as witness uh, in, in their uh, material, uh, supposedly um, gathered during investigation against him. So their allegation in the, in the forgery case is that the police didn't contact them, they don't ask uh, anything, and they uh, don't know about any investigation against Sanaula, but police submitted their statement uh, 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 saying that uh, they know Sanaullah as a foreigner. So there are, uh, the, this is an illustrative case. The, the, these cases are uh, pending still. So the accusation may uh, prove uh, to be false or um, these uh, police officials uh, uh, may get uh, punished uh, if they are convicted. This is a subject of uh, trial. But this case illustrates how the border police function and make uh, references to the foreigners tribunal. And in the foreigners tribunal, <clears throat> um, only documents are accepted. The, 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 the Guwahati High Court in several cases uh, declared that oral evidence in a proceeding under the foreigners act is not admissible. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, in spite of uh, judgment of the Supreme Court known as Lal Babu Hussein, where uh, though it is not stated that oral evidence, clearly not stated oral evidence, but uh, it is stated that in, in, in a proceeding for determination of citizenship, any evidence, uh, any documents, including any other evidence, that means clearly oral evidence, uh, should be taken into consideration. So uh, this uh, Gauti High Court uh, judgments are in contradiction with the Supreme Court judgment in Lal Babu Hussain, which is a constitutional bench judgment. The other important thing is that documentary evidence uh, are, uh, there are, uh, uh, there is also a constraint upon the documentary evidences, particularly for establishing link with the parents. Um, many people, um, mainly women who are uh, married, uh, married, um, but victims of child marriage, we can say, uh, who have no documentation, uh, they don't uh, have uh, any, Board certificates, birth certificate, because birth registration was not there, marriage registration was also not compulsory, and uh, the child marriage was, uh, though, uh, uh, and now it is made uh, a punishable offense, but earlier it was not a punishable offense as such. So uh, the child marriage was rampant, and they don't have any document to show that they are their parents' uh, uh, children. So the, for establishing link, they needed some documents and uh, it is uh, uh, for the purposes of NRC, I'm coming to the NRC after this. So for the purposes of NRC, the a, a, a panchayat uh, local government, self-government bodies were empowered to issue a certificate and uh, stating that uh, if they know or there are record, records on the basis of records or on the basis of their knowledge, they're uh, stating that this person is the son and daughter of that person. And uh, they are, because uh, local bodies, self-government bodies are based on the village and uh, those who are president are known to all the people of the village. 
so they have uh, knowledge. This comes under uh, the uh, 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 section 50 of the Indian Evidence Act that says that opinion as to the as to the relationship of uh, persons, uh, opinion of those who have reason to know about this are material. So uh, these certificates, these certificates are uh, admissible, but um, these uh, precedents of this uh, local self-government bodies are not authorized to use the national emblem. And uh, they don't know this, and they use this national emblem. And courts say, Foreigners' uh, uh, Tribunal and the High Court also say that uh, a certificate who, which bears unauthorized national emblem is not admissible in law. So this is discarded and there is no way to probe the linkage for those people and they don't, uh, uh, they cannot establish their links to their parents and therefore they are uh, uh, not Indians. Uh, uh, this is the jurisprudence which is uh, developed and which is uh, being applied in, the, in, in Asham, particularly uh, foreign, in foreign tribunals. So this uh, then, uh, First of all, uh, there, there should be documentary evidence to prove uh, this citizenship, uh, even linkage with the parents. And uh, some of the documents are not uh, admitted, even if they are otherwise relevant. Uh, Indian law for admissibility of an evidence, Indian law provides that it, if it is relevant, then it is admissible, even if uh, it is a stolen evidence, a stolen document, or it is procured illegally. Uh, uh, there are so many Supreme Court cases uh, holding this, but these are not uh, uh, applied or these are ignored in, for the purpose of uh, uh, foreigners tribunal proceedings. So this is a special uh, thing, foreigners, an, an exceptional proceeding in India. This uh, doesn't uh, deal with the Indian jurisprudence on due process and on the rule of law, on fairness. This is an uh, exceptional thing. This exception, um, uh, we can also see, see something uh, of uh, this sort of exception in the Armed Forces Special Power Act. The Armed Forces Special Power Act is also in force in Assam and uh, some other parts of the Northeast India, like Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, this uh, Armed Forces Special Power Act uh, is a temporary legislation, and uh, primarily it is meant for protection of uh, the sovereignty of India. And this uh, foreigners' tribunal processes are also in a way evoked, uh, 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 in a way justified uh, for uh, uh, protection of uh, Assam and India territorial integrity from external aggression. And uh, this uh, plea of external aggression was uh, taken by the Supreme Court in Sarbananda Sonwar case where uh, the Supreme Court uh, repealed the uh, IMDT Act this uh, IMDT Act, Illegal Immigration Determination by Tribunal Act, was enacted in 1983, and it provided uh, that the, the burden of proof should be on the state or the accuser who accuses a person of being uh, not citizen of India. And uh, this act uh, and uh, another, uh, there was a screening process because it happens that uh, uh, if a if a person has uh, some enmity or grudge uh, against another person, he would uh, give information to the police saying that this person is a Bangladeshi or uh, something like that. And uh, some expenses uh, may also be involved and then he will be referred to the foreigners tribunal. So therefore, uh, uh, IMDT provided a screening committee with local people where police uh, uh, representative will be a member and uh, other uh, 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 representative of the people will be a member. They will uh, examine the, <coughs> they would examine the uh, complaint. And if they find that uh, there is a prima facie case against the person, then they, they, they would uh, uh, approve for a referral to the foreigners, uh, to the tribunal, IMDT tribunal. So this act was held by the Supreme Court that it is 
uh, it is uh, protecting the illegal immigrants who are a threat of uh, uh, threat to the um, cultural integrity, territorial integrity of Assam. So this is an exceptional circumstances and exceptional uh, uh, provisions, uh, exceptional measures should be taken. So this uh, Foreigners uh, Tribunal Act, uh, sorry, the Foreigners Act and Foreigners Tribunal are uh, Supreme Court directed in 2006 in another uh, Sarvananda Sonwal case, the second Sarvananda Sonwal case for establishment of uh, uh, putting the burden of proof on the uh, person. So this is how the Foreigners Tribunal works. Uh, I'm not taking more time. Uh, uh, let me briefly touch upon the NRC processes. NRC processes, so this is also an exceptional process because the NRC uh, came in the legislation in uh, 2004. The amendment is known as 2003 amendment, which uh, for the first time incorporated uh, in the act, the, the illegal uh, migrant term, and also uh, empowered the state for uh, preparing a, a national register of citizens. Um, the rules are framed under this uh, uh, newly amended section, section 14A. So, <clears throat> But uh, these rules then again amended in 2009, uh, specifically providing a, 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 a special procedure for Assam, uh, where all people are asked to, all uh, residents of Assam are asked to uh, provide, produce proof of their citizenship. This is a, a, a R block uh, a mass. Uh, presumption of uh, uh, foreigners. I mean, the the the, the all resident of Assam are presumed to be foreigners. That is why the burden of proof means uh, if uh, there is a when burden of proof is on the accuser, it creates a presumption uh, against him that he is uh, uh, as uh, as as a list. So when burden of proof in the NRC process are put on all the applicants, that means all the residents of Asham. So uh, uh, it also created a presumption that all the residents of Asham could be foreigners. So uh, because the plea for the burden of proof is that the, the, the person who knows about a thing uh, should tell about that thing. Um, uh, uh, this is also taken in the Sarvananda Sonwal case, uh, which. Uh, uh, repeal the, I mean, which struck down the uh, IMDT Act, that uh, the, the the burden of proof on the person, uh, on the on the on the accused, on the alleged foreigner, because state doesn't know about him. It is he who knows about him. So the NRC, uh, uh, without declaring that burden of proof on the uh, people, but uh, put the burden of proof on the people. And then uh, uh, there is an exception to these two, exception to exception. The, uh, some people are termed as original inhabitant without defining the term, without, uh, uh, without giving a criteria how to determine uh, uh, whether they are original inhabitant or not. Original inhabitants, if the registering authorities are satisfied that they are citizens, uh, they should be registered. So without uh, any uh, documentation, without any proof of uh, documentary proof. So the, uh, this exception are in pra practice, uh, have been used to, to, to exempt a large section of people um, who are thought uh, original inhabitant on the basis of their cultural, ethnic, and uh, religious linguistic identities. And so the, the and then uh, an, uh, another problem with the NRC was that uh, NRC uh, the citizenship of uh, say the Citizenship Act of 1955 provides that uh, anybody who is born in India before 1987 is a citizen, irrespective of the status of uh, their parents. 
but uh, this uh, the NRC process or NRC application form prepared by the authorities does not have uh, any option to, to, to claim that I am citizen by birth under uh, section three. So this precluded uh, for uh, by birth citizenship claim. And then the documents, the, the, the list of documents are prepared for a set of documents for linkage and another set for establishing parent citizenship. So most of the documents, as Dr. Ramachandran mentioned that, uh, mentioned that uh, the, the people don't have all those documents due to uh, their class, their economic status, their social status and uh, um, ignorance and all those things. And th these are the official documents uh, were prepared by the officers uh, or, or of the government, government agents. And there were many errors in the documents. Most of the people who are left out of the NRC or most of the people who are declared foreigners by the FTs uh, are mainly due to the error in the spellings uh, of their names. It is uh, stated that the citizenship or even the identity of a person rests on the spelling of his or her name. So you have noticed, I think, that uh, my name appeared as Wali Lashkar first, and then I, I have corrected it because Wali is my nickname. Uh, if I am, uh, 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 this, uh, this may result in my uh, deprivation of citizenship legally, the, uh, as law is being uh, applied here. So this, uh, the, the error on uh, spelling, mismatch between, uh, minor mismatch between uh, documents. For example, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, your name in a uh, Bhutan list, subsequent Bhutan list, 1970, uh, post-1971 Bhutan list, which is not uh, a proof of your citizenship as per uh, uh, law applicable in Assam. So, but you can use this document as a proof of your link with your parents if this document has your parents' name as your parents. So, but if there is some mismatch between the main document that is proving your parents' of citizenship and this linkage document, if there are mismatch between age, for example, two, three years mismatch or spellings, then, uh, uh, or even at this, people get shifted from place to place, particularly the poor people who, 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 who keep on moving for uh, seeking livelihoods. And so some documents show them they are residents of one district, another document show that they are resident of another district or another village. So this all result in uh, a deprivation of uh, citizenship. So I think I am taking uh, much time, but uh, 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 it, the stories are very many, many stories. And I'll share these stories in another time. And I think I'll also participate in conversation later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lester. This, uh, you did cover a lot of uh, ground. And uh, as your presentation was shown, it is a very, very complicated and complex area with a lot of human costs. So thank you so much for highlighting that. Uh, and finally, we'll uh, move on to uh, Mr. Amal uh, who will be the last speaker before we open up uh, uh, questions and comments. I'm, I'm making a note of the questions and comments, so please uh, keep writing them down and I'll do my best to accommodate uh, as many of them, if not all. Uh, over to you, Amal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsin and Ashish for uh, 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 inviting me to, to speak uh, at this webinar. and. Uh, congratulations on, on a phenomenal accomplishment in, in pulling this report together. Uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic resource for the legal community, the human rights community, not just in India, but also globally, because it, it, it treats this issue with so much respect and it, uh, it takes the time and energy that's needed to, to go into the issue of nationality and citizenship deprivation 
uh, and statelessness from, from lots of different angles uh, and to come up with thoughtful uh, and, and useful recommendations as well. Uh, so we are delighted uh, at the Institute on Status and Inclusion to be associated with the report and also to be associated with this event. Uh, we ourselves, we have uh, initiated with other partners a year of action against citizenship stripping and the year of action relates to our growing concern of states uh, grabbing more power to instrumentalize citizenship and to use citizenship as a, as a weapon against citizens by depriving them of their nationality and using that as a means of excluding them from democratic participation, uh, from access to their rights, etc. And we see this uh, phenomenon happening in different contexts. So we, we see it very much so in the context of uh, counterterrorism, uh, where suspected terrorists or people even associated with suspected terrorists often find themselves at the receiving end of laws and policies and practices, which result in their citizenship being taken away from them. We see uh, it in the context of human rights defenders and dissidents and journalists in some countries in the world who are silenced uh, through the chilling effect of citizenship deprivation or the looming threat of uh, citizenship deprivation. And we see it uh, in the context of minority communities who for some reason or another, historical, contemporary, often a combination, uh, are, are seen as a community who should be targeted and excluded. And the Indian case that we're talking about today fits into this third category. Uh, and there are many other uh, examples from around the world be the Rohingya minority from Myanmar, uh, or Dominicans of Haitian origin in the Dominican Republic, uh, group, various ethnic groups in Kenya, including the ethnic Nubians and Somalis, uh, the Hill Country Tamils of Sri Lanka, the Uddu speaking community of Bangladesh. Um, and I can't go on. It's a very long list, and this is probably uh, the, 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 the greatest cause of statelessness in the world, I would say, when entire communities are targeted and excluded because of who they are and what they look like and which God they believe in uh, and what language they speak. So what we've done with the year of action is we've actually, uh, in all, before the year of action kicked off, we, we engaged in an extensive analysis of international law standards related to the right to nationality, the protection of the right to nationality and any safeguards in place that must be uh, respected by states when exercising their power to deprive citizenship. And the outcome of that process was the production of a set of principles that called the principles on, de on deprivation of nationality as a national security measure. And as the title implies, they, they were written specifically in the context of uh, the response to terrorism and other national security issues, but they very much apply to the broader issue of citizenship and the right to nationality of the individual uh, as opposed to the the power of the state to deprive that individual of that right and so the principles they they kind of synthesize and look through various international law standards uh, and they apply those standards to this very specific issue and what we find when we did that when we went through that process with the principles was that while technically states do have the right in certain very limited situations to deprive individuals of their nationality. The, the classic case being fraud, for example, if someone has fraudulently uh, obtained their nationality by, for example, in a naturalization process, lying about certain uh, things, uh, then the state technically has the right to deprive that person of their nationality once that fraud comes to light. But what we see is that when you apply this right that the state has uh, or this prerogative that the state has against all of the other obligations that states have, the obligation to not arbitrarily deprive someone of their citizenship, the obligation to not discriminate against minorities and other groups in citizenship deprivation, the obligation to avoid statelessness, the obligation to ensure that due process of the law is applied, and, and, and previous speakers have spoken about all of these obligations specifically in the context of India. The obligation to not ensure that citizenship deprivation results in other human rights violations, be it 
refoulement or sending someone back to a situation in which they would be uh, at great peril or danger, or be it the right to life or be it the freedom of security and liberty of the person, which often happens when people are then subject to arbitrary immigration detention, or be it the right to private and family life if families are separated as a result of this. So there are all of these other factors that come into play to which must be taken into account when determining whether it is non-discriminatory, non-arbitrary, fair, uh, proportionate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you apply all of these standards and obligations and layer them one on top of the other, what you find is that it's very difficult to find a situation in which nationality deprivation can be justified. And certainly in the Indian context and in, in the context of what's happened in Assam with the NRC, we would say that for the multiple reasons that, that Oliula and uh, Sujata mentioned and, and the multiple reasons that are uh, included in the report, that actually this, the, that the Indian practice contravenes its international obligations as it does contravene the, the Indian constitution as well. Uh, and so, I think it's important at this uh, juncture, particularly for those of you who are uh, operating within India and are concerned about this issue and who are kind of uh, looking for ways and means to address it through the courts and through other channels, that we also look at how this kind of practice plays out in other countries in the world and how it has played out in other countries in the world. And here you would see and again, a lot of the issues that, that were spoken about by other panelists, they, they are issues which also play out in, in the context of other and mass nationality deprivation. While he is uh, trying to rejoin, maybe we should take a few questions um, and hopefully he'll be able to come back, finish his presentation, and then we'll continue with the rest. Uh, all right, so please uh, feel free to uh, put down your questions. Now, I have made a note of a few, but in the interests of time, I'll try and, uh, and please forgive me, I'll try and summarize some of them and put them together because some of the questions are very uh, similar. Uh, and these, this, these questions, the first round of questions are from Manish, uh, an anonymous attendee and Prarthana. Um, and I guess uh, the questions may go to both uh, Mr. Laskar and Dr. Ramachandran. Uh, the question they are asking is how are women and children disparately affected in these procedures? I know Mr. Laska pointed out some of them. Uh, in particular, another question is are any other communities, say for instance, caste communities or Dalits impacted by uh, these policies, presumably talking about the NRC uh, in any most severe, comparatively severe manner? Uh, if I may sort of expand this question further, uh, is, is there any historical or legal um, or sociological lesson we can draw from the kind of impact it may have on different communities differently? And Pratna's question on the same line is more theoretical. The question is, can we think of uh, uh, ways of challenging, legally challenging this as a form of discrimination as disproportionately impacting different groups? Um, so if uh, both of you could uh, throw some light on how different identities intersectionally play out. In fact, uh, Amal is back with us. Yeah, uh, I, I, re I deeply apologize, my, my internet cut out. Uh, no I've been having problems with that over the last few days. I, I don't know when I cut out when I was speaking, but, but I apologize. So you cut out when you were talking about lessons from other countries. So maybe we'll wait for you to finish the presentation and then- I can pick that up in the answers, that's fine. All right, okay. I, can, I can come to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, so the, the question, the three set of questions which I've put together from uh, the audience were really about how these kind of policies, whether in India or uh, anywhere else, uh, particularly when it comes to Assam's NRC, has disproportionately impacted women, children, Dalits. Can, secondly, can there be a legal argument of discrimination against them? And since Amal is also here, he could also tell us a bit about how these kind of policies uh, have had disproportionate impact historically around the world as well, uh, perhaps using that as a way to uh, go back to the remainder of his demands. 
Do you want me to start then? Yes, okay. I think it would be appropriate, yes. Okay, no, that, that ties in very much actually with uh, with uh, what I was, I was talking to myself, I realized that about a bit. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, very much we see uh, this issue of multiple discrimination and intersectional discrimination coming into play where uh, minorities, uh, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, linguistic minorities, women, uh, children, they, they, they bear the disproportionate burden uh, of, of policies, and often these policies are sledgehammer policies, uh, uh, which, as, as was mentioned before, which, which kind of impose a burden of proof on the individual and a burden of proof to, to use, to prove, to provide documents which actually are the state's responsibility to provide people. So birth registration documents or other kinds of certification. And where states have historically failed to, to do that, the individual is now blamed for not having the right document or the individual is blamed for a state uh, official uh, spelling someone's name wrong in a document, for example. Uh, in the context of uh, disproportionate impact on, on women and children. So one country context where we've seen this issue uh, really take hold is in the in, in the Dominican Republic, uh, where uh, Dominicans of Haitian origin have been um, stripped of their citizenship essentially, as a result of a series of first legal and then Supreme Court uh, interventions, uh, which very restrictively interpreted the Dominican nationality law and then brought in new laws to further restrict it, and then ultimately uh, had a constitutional change to further restrict it. And in a nutshell, what happened was, whereas under the previous legal regime, uh, anyone who was born in the Dominican Republic post-1929 uh, was a Dominican citizen, unless you were born to parents who were in transit, and by in transit, uh, the law really meant if your parents are diplomats, for example, or if you if they were visiting on holiday. So that in transit provision was reinterpreted as if you were didn't have a legal status in the country, which is now how we, not how it was meant. And that meant that in a twenty third through a twenty thirteen Supreme Court judgment, people born in the country after nineteen twenty nine, so going back multiple generations, suddenly found themselves in this situation where they had to find the documentation to prove the legal status of their parents and their grandparents, et cetera. And this judgment, it disproportionately targeted those of Haitian origin. And it disproportionately targeted for various socio sociocultural reasons, uh, women, uh, girls who were less likely to be registered than, than boys uh, back in, like a few decades ago, for example. And so you see the way intersectional uh, discrimination kind of plays a role. I mean, with Myanmar, uh, it's the same context, the same situation where the Rohingya, uh, through a series of legal, uh, uh, ju juridical, as well as extra legal measures, were had the quality of their citizenship eroded and then their citizenship completely taken away from them. And what we often find in these countries, whether it's the Dominican Republic or, or, or Syria with the Kurds or, or Kuwait with the Bidun or India in the context of Assam, is that there is this imaginary point in history to which you are required to kind of tie yourself through proving lineage, lineage and residence in the country back to that point in history. And that burden disproportionately falls on you. And so if you look different, if you come from an impoverished background, uh, if you are a woman, it makes it more difficult for you to actually prove that. Uh, I hope that answered the question and also allowed me to smuggle in the, uh, the rest of what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Samal. Uh, uh, Sujata uh, and Oliola, uh, any any thoughts on that? Maybe starting with uh, Sujata. Yeah, you might be on mute. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sorry. Now can you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, Uliula, let's start with uh, Sujata and then we'll come to you. I think she was already speaking. Yeah. 
Um, I think I, I before I answer that question, I, I, I'm, I agree with Amal that when communities are targeted, when actually fear and suspicion drive such exercises, then the procedural protections <laughs> become very weak. They, they actually have a much uh, a marginal role to play because had the had it been driven by a desire to include and may ensure that people are not uh, excluded for whatever reason, I think the, 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 the contours of that exercise would have been slightly different. Um, as far as uh, the gender dimension is concerned, I must say that it is very, I have done some work on detention and it is extraordinarily difficult to do work on detention because my understanding is that they have not given access to detention centers. They have not allowed civil society groups in many instances to go to the detention centers. So whatever material is available publicly I have used and there are um, you know, several challenges with, with, those, with that data, but at least it is documenting something. It is putting something on paper so that it's starting the process because uh, otherwise there was very little work that was available. Um, I'm just going to reinforce the point that Mr. Lasker made was that women may be in fact even less likely to be able to prove that, that burden of, you know, confirming their citizenship status because of the social and cultural rituals surrounding marriage where women don't necessarily, are often not married in their own villages. They are married off into other areas. Uh, and as Mr. Lasker pointed out in several cases, these women may not have uh, even attended uh, many years of schooling, in some cases, no years of schooling. So all of those elements can actually add to uh, the, the problem of, of proving citizenship status. And we know that in the case of the NRC, um, there was a many women could only provide gram panchayat certificates and there was a whole question about whether those gram panchayat certificates per se would be accepted unless they could provide linking documents connecting to their families other family members and that was a very big challenge as well so i think uh, clearly gender is a very key dimension that needs to be paid attention to i'm not sure if i i hope i've answered the question uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lasker, I, if I would just add, because you did talk about the question of gender uh, and also the category of uh, original inhabitants, would you say there are any other groups in your experience which uh, may have been disproportionately impacted, maybe uh, disabled people, disproportionately illiterate people, a class-based sort of, which may or may not count legally as discrimination perhaps, but definitely certain categories of people who are at a considerable more disadvantage in these legal procedures beyond uh, gender. Just to simply put, uh, they, the, the, those, uh, the more marginalized are, uh, uh, the more disproportionately targeted, they disproportionately suffered in these uh, processes, the, 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 the NRC particularly. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the sex workers or uh, the, the uh, 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 children who are living in orphanages or the LGBTQI or other people living in the margins of the society, uh, homeless, landless people, because these people don't have any documentation um, uh, to show. And uh, the, uh, apart from this, I think the questions um, uh, was also about uh, whether the other communities, other ethnic groups uh, uh, in Assam are uh, also made victim of those processes, particularly Dalit people, um, the, the tea tribes, I think. Though they, 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 this is, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, the, the classification of people uh, between original inhabitant and uh, uh, those who are not original inhabitant. So uh, at first, uh, these people, particularly tea tribes, the Adivasis, uh, were not included as original inhabitants. So uh, they were uh, <clears throat> like the other people, like particularly Bengali speaking community, uh, Hindi speaking communities, and uh, Manipuri speaking communities uh, are uh, required to produce documents as provided in the, in the, in the, in the modalities. So, but uh, then they filed an application and Supreme Court directed specifically that the tribes people should be um, considered as 
its original inhabitant without elaborating on any criteria or ground. So they are uh, uh, treated as original inhabitant. But uh, I have come across cases uh, in the foreigners' tribunals that uh, there are uh, three tribes people are also uh, declared uh, uh, foreigners. And uh, uh, they have to go to High Court, Supreme Court, and who can. And uh, I'm not, but I'm not aware that um, uh, uh, any of uh, any from these T type communities are uh, as of now in the detention center or not. But uh, almost 90 percent people in the detention centers are uh, belonging to Bengali speaking communities, both Muslim and Hindus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lasse. Uh, I'll take two uh, sort of bunch of more questions and put them as two questions together. Uh, I'm aware we are really short of time. So I'll request the panelists to uh, give brief comments uh, in response to it. One question is, this is Jay's question about the, he's asking about the role of the high court in Assam. But if I may broaden it even further to ask what has been the role of the higher judiciary, um, both in Assam and outside, and perhaps the role of judiciary in general in these kind of cases. And if I could sort of frame it slightly differently, what hope can we have from uh, judiciaries uh, in India or judiciaries around the world in these kind of uh, these kind of problems? And the second question is, uh, well, uh, one of the anonymous attendees asked, why is it that exclusion happens so quickly and naturalization takes so much time? Uh, if I may reframe that question, why is it in, in specifically in the case of India? that the inevitable negative consequences of many of these citizenship processes in what say for instance statelessness, why is it that the state is taking so long to reckon with those negative consequences and not addressing them one way or the other? So if I could take the first question uh, to, uh, to Mr. Lasker very quickly, Mr. Lasker, if you could give your quick evaluation of the high court's role and also your expectations from the Indian judiciary. So, in terms of uh, the <clears throat> opinions uh, rendered by the foreigners tribunals, so in some cases, uh, High Court, uh, I mean, uh, the High Court gives some relief, uh, gives some time, uh, particularly in uh, cases where the people are declared uh, foreigners ex parte. In those cases, um, in, in most of those cases, if there are reasonable grounds that uh, um, the High Court uh, give them uh, bail, grants them bail, and then give them time to to to, to contest the case in the foreigners tribunal. And this is a huge, uh, I mean, relief uh, because there are thousands of people who are declared foreigner ex parte without hearing them. So, but then the High Court also uh, uh, evolved a sort of jurisprudence which is exceptional, which is special, and which does not take into account the uh, larger Indian jurisprudence, particularly on due process. And uh, the, everybody knows that the NRC was NRC process was uh, in a way uh, over uh, uh, was conducted under the oversight of the Supreme Court of India. So the role of Supreme Court was not so clear in the, the NRC processes. Uh, yeah. Sujata, please go ahead. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, one of the points that I made in my presentation was that the role of the court has been very dualistic. It is very contradictory uh, when courts uh, and judges really uh, play their, perform their role properly, judiciously, then uh, you have very progressive judgments. And on the other hand, you have uh, courts that have uh, essentially forced the Indian state, uh, the central government and even state governments to uh, increase the number of people they are detaining and deporting. We know that it was the Supreme Court that repealed the IMDT Act on the ground that it had acted as a major hurdle to large scale deportation of Bangladeshi migrants. I'm also think of, of another judgment uh, 
in, a, in another case involving the Delhi High Court in the early 2000s, I think uh, it's called Chetan Dath versus Union of India, in which the court arbitrarily imposed a quota of 3,000 Bangladeshi migrants to be identified every month by the Delhi government, which a quota that the Delhi government could not meet at all, and constantly criticized the government for failing to deport large numbers. So courts have played a very contradictory role. And clearly, that contradiction is reflective of what is happening in the broader society, where there is growing consensus on the issue of the, the, the irregular Bangladeshi migrants in particular. And it is driven by the idea that India has been too soft, and therefore, we really need to um, take, uh, you know, expand our measures to deter such migrations. It's uh, and and a critical understanding of the these processes that have been used has been really lacking until very recently, only when the Citizenship Act was amended to include only certain religious minorities from neighboring countries. And the NRC process was happening simultaneously. Did you see a shift in that discourse where there was much more um, opposition and much more criticism because those challenges were magnified quite clearly by coverage by newspapers and other media outlets. So I'm going to end my answer there. Thank you. Uh, Amal, your responses and perhaps your final remarks. I mean, why are states quick to exclude and slow to include? I think that's a fantastic question and it, uh, it kind of goes to the crux of uh, uh, everything that we do around this kind of uh, field of nationality rights and citizenship and, and statelessness. Um, and I, I think that if we can answer that question, we will probably be able to end a lot of exclusion in the world. I mean, in, in, I, I think it goes down to identity politics and, and this idea of who belongs or who legitimately has a role to play in building the identity of the nation state and this very kind of tribal way at which we we have gotten accustomed to to looking at who constitutes the in-group within our countries uh, and that has made it politically easy for states to to enact exclusionary politics and even popular for them to do so and until that modus operandi is questioned and until we come to a point where it's no longer politically popular or populist to do that, then I think we're going to find ourselves in a situation where states increasingly resort to this kind of tactic of easy exclusion uh, without really putting in the hard work that's needed to include people and uh, create a more inclusive citizenship, which is uh, uh, what is required for democracy to actually function. So I think there's a role for citizens to play there to actually hold political leaders to account. Uh, and there's a much deeper kind of educational role as well. Uh, and we need to be doing the hard work in challenging stereotypes and, and dismantling uh, the underlying causes of exclusion, be it uh, racism or xenophobia or the, or the patriarchy. Uh, and until, and until we are better at doing that, I think politicians will find the part of reason the path of least resistance actually is the one which allows them to, to build up this other and blame them for their failings and kind of scapegoat them. And as long as that easy politics can be played, we will find ourselves in this situation over and over again. Uh, so that's, I don't think that's, that's an answer that fully answers your question because it's such a kind of fundamental one. But I, I think those are the lines along which we should be thinking. Uh, to try and find the most sustainable way of addressing these challenges, which are going to be become, I think, increasingly common. Thank you so much, Amal. Um, on that somber note, um, I think I, at the risk of exceeding time, which we have, but I'll still take a minute uh, for a round of expressing gratitude, uh, starting with our three uh, excellent distinguished speakers, our panelists, and you made uh, this is a wonderful conversation. So thank you so very much for uh, uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, I mean, if I may just take a few more minutes to thank the other people who were involved. Uh, we had Jay, uh, Livanshi is here, and uh, Ashish, uh, the team at Parichay, the team at Jindal for making this uh, webinar happen. 
uh, I also uh, really want to go over the list of commentators uh, who really made the report happen. The report was a collaboration among the students, but we had a lot of intellectual support uh, from a number of wonderful scholars, our colleagues who gave us amazing reviews, their regular feedback. Um, we had Andre Emanuel, Angshman Chaudhary, Ashna Ashish, Kali Krako, Darshana Mitra, Jessica Field, Shagnita, Suraj Gurira Shankar, and Tibo Vigilt. Uh, thank you so much for your time uh, in giving us your wonderful feedback. Uh, the report would not be what it is uh, without that. Um, and on behalf of all the authors, I would also like to thank uh, uh, Raki, uh, uh, Raki uh, Nika, uh, Nika Hedithia, uh, our friend who contributed with the cover page, Abhilash Radhakrishnan, who designed this wonderful report, it looks great. And on behalf of myself, I would like to thank all the authors, the students who did all the work, um, uh, Anushri, Arunima, Kosh, Veda, Vrinda, Yamani, Mandine, Claire, Flora, Helen, Theo. Thank you so much for working so hard on the report. And of course, finally, Ashish, Mr. Yadav, who was a research supervisor, the main correspondent, uh, the guy who dealt with the IT, the person who basically ran the show. So thank you so much, Ashish, and his team of wonderful students, our commentators, of course, our advisors, our panelists for making this happen. Thank you so much, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. And remain safe. Uh, our best wishes to your health and the health of all your family and friends.